hello, my beautiful babe. I'm Brenda Davies, the creator and host of God is Gray. And today I have a really interesting conversation for you. This is a conversation I had with one of my dear friends, Lauren Deliri. She is indigenous. She used to be really big in the Christian music industry and world. And she has since deconstructed her faith and gone on this long journey with her wonderful husband, Adam Frost. They have a podcast of their own called Deconstruct that they're about to debut again together as a couple. And this conversation, I'm so excited to say, went into a lot of different directions that I'm looking forward to sharing with you. For example, Lauren and I talked a bit about duality. Can you have anger and rage and be an angel baby at the same time? Can you hold an opinion and then change it? Can you express an opinion and then apologize for it and change your whole worldview on a certain subject? All of the answers there for me are yes, yes, and yes. And also because Lauren Deliri is indigenous and white, she has really gone on this incredible little exploration of tapping into her ability to communicate with her ancestors. And because her and I were involved in this cancellation together, I talked about this on last week's podcast, one of the revelations she got or the things that she really chewed on was this notion that whoever you are, no matter where you're from, no matter what your background, we all have ancestors and we all have the freedom, ability and capacity to communicate with those ancestors, AKA speak to the dead. I know any Christians listening to this might feel very freaked out by an idea like this. You'll think of things like witchcraft and you know, all of the ways that ancestry and tapping into that has been demonized. Just maybe try to let your hair down a little bit, let your guard down a little bit, and just listen to this conversation between two dear friends because we have both really been changing our minds on these things and really realizing more and more that spirituality cannot and should not ever be limited, that this world really offers us an opportunity to explore endlessly until the day we die what it is to be spiritual. If you're Christian, what it means to be a Christian. If you don't subscribe to any particular religion, what that means for your spirituality. So I got into some ghost stories, some stories about my ancestry, and Lauren gave us some tips on how we can tap in and consider speaking to the dead. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Yeah, I just can't believe how much I've repressed pieces of my personality and everything. Even right now, I'm thinking about how, like, can I just press record with you and just like speak to you? Like we always talk to each other. And then as soon as I imagine sharing this portion of what we're talking about, I want to be like, oh, and I over explain myself and get into my like perfectionist yeah. mode. So everything is about like shedding that, but it's no one's fault. Like I have always been little miss perfect. I watched a, um, TikTok video last night of someone talking about avoidant attachment style, which is something that I realized that I am like, I didn't, Mm -hmm. I, I fancied myself securely attached because I can be so laissez faire when I like break up with somebody or whatever. And I'm like, I'm so yeah. attached. And then I'm like, oh no, that's called avoidance and like hiding my feelings. <laughs> everything's okay. And I never saw this correlated to perfectionism, but the video is talking about how if you were the perfect golden child in your family, which is like every child tends to take a role in, yeah. in families. There's four of us. So there's like the rebel, the good girl, the comedian, you know? Same. Yeah. That was, we had four of us too. There you go. That's so funny. So I took the perfectionist role and, um, and apparently that plays perfectly into my avoidant attachment too, because I don't want to show people who I really am. And I get afraid that if I show you the fullness of me, that I won't be accepted and then I'll be rejected for like at the core of myself. And if I yeah. intellectualize it, I'm like, but I don't care. Like if someone re- doesn't resonate with me, it's perfectly okay. Like I can intellectualize that. But then when I go out into the world, like since my cancellation and our experience together, it's the first time that I've ever had um, 
what's it called? Social anxiety. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden I was really like, oh, am I going to be okay out here? And it's exhausting. Yeah. It's interesting because for me, I mean, I had the same thing and I chose the perfectionist thing too. And instead of like, feeling like people were going to reject me because I'm showing certain sides. I, and it's a theme all throughout my life. And the lesson I keep learning is it's okay to like, you know, be a little of this and a little of that. And it's okay to even be a contradiction at some points because like we're always evolving. So my thing is like, I've always struggled to, I, I, like I've been scared to seem um, like, well, to seem contradictory or to seem like confusing or like crazy or flip floppy, like somehow like that was really like, I don't know what happened to me or why I have it in my head that that's such a bad thing. Um, and it's like more of a recent lesson for me to learn that like it's actually OK, like being contradictory at some point in your life is just being human because we learn lessons and we evolve um, or else we're forever stunted and like th- who wants that? Like, I want to keep moving um, and show all the different pieces and parts of me and embrace those too. Um, but yeah, it's just interesting how like even in a sibling lineup and all of that family dynamics, I feel like it always keeps coming up for me too um, because religion did a number on me. But really, like when I get down to it, a lot of it is family dynamics um, and having to work through a lot of that and how like I approach the world and see the world, the perspective I see through. Um, is really reflected, I think, back on a lot of my family dynamics. I mean, yeah, I love that. And you're talking about like the duality or being contradictory. That's so interesting to me too, because there's such a huge um, weight or idea that you're supposed to like be who you are and, and say what you are, but be that and, and never Mm. contradict yourself. And, you know, you better not have thought one thing in the past. Otherwise that can come back to haunt you, even though you've completely changed your position and you behave differently, like whatever it is, it's like not allowing people to grow and move forward or even try ideas, concepts Mm. or thoughts on for size. Like, we were just swimming in a pool in Beverly Hills together with your husband, Adam. And Adam was like teasing me or not te- like gent- like just like being loving. And he's like, I love what a contradiction you are. Like I wrote this Aww. like message about how I was going to react to the cancellation and like what I wanted to say. And then literally woke up the next morning and was like, I'm not going to say any of that actually. And <laughs> I know. I love it. I mean, I told him too um, after he was like telling me a little bit about your conversation. And I was like, well, you know, she's a Gemini, right? (laughs) And he goes, yeah. I was like, it checks out. (laughs) Totally. And I also like felt like um, so when like creating God is gray and everything, like I explained in my last video that like I went so perfect girl because I was talking about religion and those subjects and I felt like I had to be perfect all over again and use the exact perfect language language to articulate myself. So everyone understood. And so I was never misunderstood. And then I was like out in the world and I am also from Jersey in addition to being a Gemini and I (laughs) love to pop off and I love to be petty. Like if I could have one dream or fantasy in my life, it's to just do the pettiest thing. Like I watch Jersey Shore and watch Jay Wow popping off and I'm like, oh, to be Jay Wow, like what a gorgeous, like free <laughs> life that she lives. So like that persona lives inside of me. And I used to take a lot of pride in that. And in some ways I do, because there is so much strength to being like, yeah, if you come for me, I will have something to say. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to back down. I will speak my mind. And that is quite easy for me to do in real life. And Mm. then it was like, as soon as I got on the internet, those dueling sides, like super separated. And then it was like, wait, am I never supposed to pop off now? Because now I'm perfect again. And what if someone saw me out in the world yelling at a woman in a parking lot? Is that God is gray? Is that not God is gray? Interesting. Yeah. Guess what? It is actually. And there's parts of that that don't serve me. Like that parking lot example, like this woman started going off on me um, because she thought we stole her spot, but we didn't. But she was like using all these slurs against me and stuff. And I was like, you know what? Fuck you. And (laughs) my partner at the time 
did not like that because he was like, yeah. that's dangerous also. Like, you don't know, you really want to physically fight with this woman in the parking lot. Like she looked rough around the edges and I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> maybe I don't. Maybe I take that back. You know, I'm like, yeah. Maybe I do, but maybe I don't. And, um, and then there's other parts of like that part serves me really well when the nurse at Kaiser Permanente was trying to delay my son's biopsy. Yeah. That Jersey girl came and popped off and I was like, no, actually you're giving it to him today. There's nothing you can fucking say, go figure it out. Yeah. So it's like, she serves me. It's just a matter of figuring out where she belongs in my life and how to best move through the world, but also be okay with the fact that that's also like my family. Those are my like Jersey girl roots. It's just a huge part of who I am. Yeah. Yeah. How do you feel like that went like whenever this, the cancellation thing happened, do you think Jersey girl like went to sleep or do you think she was like ready to go and you were just trying to keep her back or like, where was she? The thing about the Jersey girl is like, it's hard for me to pop off in defense of myself. Mm -hmm. Like there's a part of me that loves going off so much that I would almost like lie and wait, or someone would tell me like, did you see when that guy attacked that girl for being X, Y, or Z? And I'd be mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm so sad I wasn't there. I could have went off on him and I would have a good excuse, you know? Yeah. So like basically when we were getting canceled. I was, I felt like I wanted to go and fight someone in a parking lot on behalf of you, frankly, mm -hmm. watching white women call you white passing and saying, you need to sit down and shut up and you don't have any place to talk about your heritage. You need to prove you're, you're indigenous. Like that made me want to be like, okay, let's take our hoops off on me with the mom's <laughs> parking lot. It's right. Like <laughs> let's freaking go. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that. I saw bits I and like pieces. I, would. <laughs> I, I know. I know. I feel like, yeah, I feel like I felt bits and pieces of that Jersey girl, like in our conversations when it was all happening, I think. Um, so like, I, I felt really supported through that and through our conversations. Um, I think something that, I mean, you mentioned you did kind of want to talk about today was one of the things that I got out of that whole experience was I watched so throughout my like deconstruction reconstruction and all of that being indigenous I realized that my ancestors and my heritage are just a huge part of who I am um there was a time where I thought like maybe I'm an atheist but I can't be fully atheist because I'm like spiritual so I called myself a mystical atheist but that somehow put me in a camp that didn't feel right either um I feel very connected spiritually to my ancestors. And so when watching, watching this whole thing go down and the cancellation and, you know, being called, you know, white passing or completely not talked about at all, um, which is a form of erasure uh, and just like being removed from the conversation, not by you, but by a large amount of people. Um, the thing that I, I kept seeing was people like yourself white people <laughs> and other white people, <laughs> um, you know, they would say things like, you know, as if they couldn't think for themselves in this conversation. Cause it was, a, it was, it was about multiple uh, caveats, but mostly about race, this big conversation. And it was as if white people couldn't talk for themselves and couldn't think for themselves not talk for themselves, think for themselves. They're like, well, I need somebody who's brown or whoever to, but a specific type of brown, like a dark brown and a disabled brown and a this brown, like, you know what I mean? Like somehow I was not brown to them. Um, but anyway, the, it's like they couldn't have their own experiences. It's as if they didn't have their own ancestors. And I think it was through like all of that and then talking with you directly and, you know, a couple of our other friends, um, you know, mentioning, you know, I'm, you and your ancestors talking to me, you know, as if only I have ancestors. And I'm like, well, what about yours? Uh, and that was like a really big wake up call as well for me because I'm also mixed. So I don't just have brown ancestors um, and I don't want to just ignore all of them. So anyway, all that to say, it really woke me up to, hey, like everybody's got ancestors. I just don't think everybody feels like they're allowed to embrace them or look into them or that they're worthy of ancestors I mean we all have them we're all here like if you're alive and you have a body today like 
you have an ancestor, you have multiple, you have lots and lots of them. Um, and so that was a big, I don't know, I got really impassioned about people realizing that, I mean, their lived experience is just as important as like somebody else. It does like, it goes back to the simplest, like race and ability and like where you've grown up. Like that doesn't like it matters, but that doesn't change that you also have a lived experience. We all have lived experiences and we all have ancestors. So anyway, that was like, um, one of my biggest things that I kind of like walked away with and it really has paved the way for what I love to talk about now and what I'm impassioned about now. Um, telling people how they can connect with their ancestors and that, Hey, white people, you're allowed because I'm mixed and I'm allowed to call on my white ancestors too. Uh Yes. So much there. I think that, you know, another really striking thing that happened in the cancellation was noticing the, the same pattern that repeats over and over again in my life as a woman, which is women tearing down women. Like mm-hmm. I didn't see men in the deconstruction play space being like, come for him, you dude, come for him. Like we were doing that to each other as women. And the thing that people need to realize, and I know is so valid is yes, every single ancestry and line has particular sorts of trauma. Some family lines obviously have more recent historical traumas that are like embodied and too close to home. And that is a whole different thing. Obviously, you know, I don't have to name those people. Like we know who they are. And then there's other people though, that have like full embodied contemporary traumas that they have obviously every right to work through and their ancestors can help them through them as well. Like we as women come for each other all the time, tear each other down. And it's because first of all, we are, we have a scarcity complex. We all grow up in misogyny and this place where like, if there was a TV show, one girl gets cast as like the token girl who's in the crew. And if you're in a business meeting, there's one girl who's that, you know, like there was so Mm -hmm. little space for us in every door that I think we just fell into this patriarchal idea that we have to tear each other apart for a space at the table. And what all of us are trying to say right now is that's not true. Everyone has their own story. Your trauma is valid, no matter what color your skin is, no matter how able-bodied or not you are, no matter what neurodivergence you have, like everyone is welcome to their experience. And no one has to worry about, you know, the, the term, for example, like white tears, like it got to a point where like anyone white was like not allowed to be devastated about something or that- white or passing. white passing that's the other thing too it's like they the white tears was like has been used against people who are technically white passing essentially what i've learned and this could be like a hot take you you don't have to include this if you don't want to but to me where where white passing that term has like gone I have, I, I used to all the time say like, I'm white passing, like brown identity, white, pa- like, but I'm white passing and I get that and I have white privilege. I understand. But now it's been used so much against me in so many different ways that now I've just realized like uh, that what people really mean is that you're not black passing. And that's, fi- that's absolutely fine. I uh, understand that I'm not black passing. There are other people who I have, I, I have mixed black and white friends who are technically white passing because you know they they're not they're not black they're not dark black so I just feel like that has been used and convoluted to gas white people um and I understand that white privilege exists and that I have that but when a white person is calling me white passing I'm just like why like what's your what's your point what are you teaching me like what are you what are you getting at Like, do you not think I know what it's like to live a nuanced experience being a mixed person? Don't you think I have mixed feelings about a lot of different things? Um, So that was something that came up, too, during this whole thing. But I don't know. That was a side tangent. (laughs) It's not a tangent. You're exactly right. Like, it was... um... (sighs) Yeah. And of course, sticky subject. But listen, whatever. Like, 
I was remembering uh, there was like this color wheel. There was like a meme of a color wheel that Peter from what's that show called? The the cartoon family. What is it? Family Guy. Family yeah. Guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's holding up like a color palette or something with like all colors of skin on it from like dark to light. And I was looking at that and I was like, at what point on this color thing is someone allowed to speak? as a person who has an experience of like being embodied as a person of color. And like one good example right, right. of it, besides what you went through is I was just talking to my friend who's Egyptian and she grew up in Australia and she said the same thing. She said she spent her whole life having people rob her of her identity or have having called her white passing and all that stuff. And she's like, Nobody knows that when I was in Australia, surrounded by blonde white people, that I was not white passing anywhere. I was harassed incessantly for my brown skin. So the audacity, like for me, if you as a person of color would like to identify yourself as a white passing person or say that, hey, I haven't had racial experiences. I haven't been treated differently because of the color of my skin or my heritage great. Like that's on you. I'm going off on a tangent because really what you and I have talked about with our friendship in the aftermath of this whole thing is that you ended up feeling really invigorated and enlivened by the idea that you could project the message that we all have ancestors and that all yeah. of us have valuable stories to tell, that all of our histories include a wide variety of experiences, negative, positive, everything in between, and that tapping into that is accessible to all of us, no matter where you come from. So tell me what it's like to tap into your ancestors and what that actually looks like in real time. I, I always tell you that I know one of the biggest elements of my ancestors is like my cheekiness. Like whenever I get like cheeky or like protective of, of other people um, and like my peep, like my community, um, I know it, like it, it stems from them because naturally I'm, I'm quite like careful. I'm a very careful person. Um, and so anyway, any cheekiness, any like kind of stepping out in that way, I know comes from my ancestors for sure. Um, and the other thing I was going to say when I've been having conversations about ancestors is it, they don't have to be related to you. Um, because, you know, all, everybody's got a different story. I mean, there's people who've been adopted. There's people who, you know, have lived their whole lives without even like parental care, truly. Um, and so, first of all, it, your ancestors can go, like your connection to them can be, you know, your grandmother or your great grandmother or like even further back. There could be an ancestor who's like wanting to be in, in connection with you. But also there can be someone who cared for you or who knew you, who knew of you, Um that wasn't related to you that can be trying to get in contact with you. And I also encourage people who that's their experience. Um, cause I don't want anyone to feel left out when it comes to what I consider a really beautiful part of being a human being is the fact that we all do come from somewhere. Um, I myself have experienced, uh, guidance and moments with my, my mom's stepdad who who wasn't he's not blood related to me um and so I've like I've done I've done work with him that sounds so like serious that's so like t like um spiritual guru but like I have uh yeah I don't know I I've heard messages from him he helped me find our house um he actually had to come through though my grandmother who is blood related to me because I was so cut off from hearing from anyone who wasn't related to me. Um, and that's how I got this message is that, you know, everybody can be connected to an ancestor that's not related. Um, because he worked really hard to get to me. He went through, um, her. And then he also went through, uh, I did a Reiki session back early in 2020. It had nothing to do with him. I didn't think or anything. Uh, this girl, like two years later messaged me and she was like, Hey, I don't normally do this, but somebody is trying to get to you. And I don't think they're going to leave me alone until I tell you, is it okay? So anyway, she described him and I was like, Oh my gosh, that's pop pop. 
whatever. He knew me as a baby. Um, and all that to say, like, you certainly don't have to be related to an ancestor or a guide. Um, the word I use is ancestor because that feels closest to me what represents like that that feeling like I believe that your ancestors also live within you too um and that is a cool part about a bloodline ancestor is that you literally have them in your blood um which is cool but they don't have to be um and and I know you've talked about some uh, experiences you've had too and you know that weren't your your relative and I think that's really cool and I want people to embrace that more I think so many of us just get so we put rules on spirituality and that's the one thing that like there's not rules like we're we're always going to be figuring it out and if we figure out spirituality I'm just like well what what are we doing here like I'm just not like the best part and I will say the 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 one message that comes through from my ancestors every time and to anyone else I think my ancestor wants me to tell everyone is that being human is the best part Right. Like they're disembodied now. They are no longer in a body. They're no longer living life. They're no longer like in this experience. And we have the best part. We can move and groove and we can mess up and we can fall in love and, you know, do all these things. We can have experiences with one another. This being human is the best part. And I think, you know, everybody's got their own thing that they live by. But for me, that's like what they keep telling me. Every time I hear from my ancestors and every time I feel connected to them, whether I get like a download or a message from them or I hear a story about them that like makes another message make sense, the one streamline that stays through always is like being human is the best part. So be a human and try to be a good one, a nice one, but enjoy like it, enjoy all of it. And that's a big part of like what I, what I really am passionate about here and in my own experience, but also just telling everyone else is just, just be a human. Don't worry about the rest. Like be a human. And I think the spiritual stuff will, will come if it, if it, if it's supposed to, if you want it to, if you need it to, I think it will. Um, but being like embodied is truly the, the best part. Hi, beautiful people. Please do give me a moment to tell you about Dipsy. When I heard about Dipsy's short and sexy audio stories, I wasn't expecting to love listening as much as I do. I've never read romance novels or erotica, but Dipsy really blew me away. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. They bring scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and characters, no matter who you're into or what turns you on. New content is released every week as well, so in between listening to your favorite stories over and over again, you can always find something new to explore. Dipsy also has sleep stories, wellness stories, and now they offer written stories. This is your go-to place to spice up your me time, explore your fantasies, or heat things up with a partner. For listeners of God is Grey, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash in the gray. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash in the gray. Dipsystories.com slash in the gray. I resonate with everything that you said and having a baby has been really interesting for me because obviously I've talked a lot about abortion and my stance on that. And now that I have a baby, there's a major reckonings with spirit and where do we come from before this happens? And do we choose each other? And whatever anyone else wants to believe, I'll just tell you what I've come to believe at this moment in my life, which is that I really believe we make soul packs together. Like even my ex um, that I have a baby with, I think fondly of him when I imagine what if we made this pact beforehand to be like, why don't we trigger each other in these specific ways? And why don't I teach you this by doing this? And we like act out these scenes together as human beings. And 
bounce off of each other to help with purpose for each other to grow and learn and like move forward. That's why it's so important to me that we get rid of shame and fear and pain. And then we move greater and greater towards love and acceptance of one another. But like all of that comes down to how are we constantly bouncing off the energy of other people? Because people will invite you to learn the worst parts of yourself and the best parts of yourself. And each person you encounter is a gift. But then when you think about like, I was watching my son play in the bathtub and that's exactly what he invites me to like enjoying the embodied experience and realizing that I have a body because so often I've resented it, especially in times of deep depression, which I have vacillated in and out of throughout like Mm -hmm. my entire adulthood. Those moments, I'm like, what is the point of this? Why am I stuck here? I don't want to do this. But if I watch my son laser focus on the water draining out of the tub And he like puts his finger in a little tornado and he's like laughing about it and delighted. I imagine like, well, he's chosen to embody with me. He's come here as such a great gift to me. We chose each other. I feel that in the pit of my soul. I feel he's come to heal me from different traumas. And also he's inviting me into play and he's inviting me back to my body. Birth Mm -hmm. obviously is a gigantic invitation to get back into your body. But even like, he's like, look at this thing the water does. And when I'm in mega states of depression, that's the last thing I would be noticing, but that's a part of the embodied experience. So just imagine our our ancestor, it is like disembodied and coming here to like serve us in any way, give us tips and tricks. And all of it is like incredible. And the last thing I'll say before I want you to talk again (laughs) is uh, that you are instrumental in helping me reckon with the idea that I have ancestors and that they can communicate with me because in Christianity, I was taught the dead stay dead. And if you're talking to anyone that's dead, it's a demon. Or if anyone's trying to tell you anything to help you for your future, it's a demonic entity and come to be like, wow, that sounds really dumb. Actually, that can't be true because like one story I'll share that really awakened me to this idea. And in talking to you, there was one pivotal moment where I was like honoring your ancestors and your heritage. And you were like, but what about yours? What about your witches? And my major witch is my dad's grandmother. And granted, I think most of the women in my lineage have this like about them, this power and this like soothsaying intuitive force within them when they were embodied and now disembodied. But when I was married, super Christian at the time, I was camping with my ex-husband and he was like, woke up in the like three o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the morning in the middle of this dense forest. We're all alone. And he shakes me and he's like, Brenda, I just had a dream about this little girl. And she was following me through a house. And I was like, Hey, can we table this for the morning? Like, can you not tell me a horrifying dream in the middle of the forest right now? So he's like, okay, okay. So I just like cuddle him. We fall back asleep. The next morning we are hiking and I'm like, oh, tell me about that dream about the little girl. And he was like, oh, I don't know why I said little girl. It wasn't a little girl, but it was, I was walking into this house and it was like a really skinny house sandwiched between other skinny houses. And he is a California boy. So I'm like, you're talking about a row home or a brown. (laughs) And he's like, yeah, 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 that. (laughs) And um, I'm like, okay. And he's like, everything is like 1940s, 50s old. And I see this woman with long black hair walking through the house. And I keep trying to reach out to her to touch her. And we, he describes in great detail, going up the stairs, going through these double doors with lace on the doors and everything. And then he said, he finally caught up to her and she was standing at a window and he went to touch her and she like ran into this glass door, spun around, her black hair disappeared and it turned into me. And she goes, hi. (laughs) She goes, hi, beautiful people. (laughs) People, Yeah. Oh my God. That would be horrible. (laughs) She's a YouTuber. Um, But my hair stood up, like I'm in my late thirties now. This is when I was like 24, my hair stood up and I was like, that's my grandmother. 
you're talking about. And I was really afraid of her. My dad was so afraid of her that he threw out her crystal ball in the trash when she died, which Horrific. drives me crazy now. <laughs> we actually oh. went to go visit that house and it's going to be torn down in like a couple oh. weeks. And we just happened to visit it right before um, when I was just in Jersey. So me and my dad were recounting that. And I was like, I didn't want to go in on him because he's still not into it. But I'm like, oh, that crystal ball. I can't believe he threw it out. When did he throw that out? Like as an adult, I assume? Threw it out as an adult. His whole thing was like, he has all these ghost stories that... I would love to write a book about one day. My dad is an incredible storyteller. And from his point of view, his mom was inviting in a lot of unmanageable energies. Mm -hmm. A lot of them really scared him. He has this incredible story where he is like in front of a mirror in his bathroom in the bathtub when he was really little. And he says his parents were fixing something. So the mirror for the, the, sink was on the floor. So he's in the bathtub and he's doing all these things with his hands and dancing and just watching himself. And at one point he like puts up his one hand, puts up the other and smiles. And apparently his reflection is not matching what he's doing. Oh my God. That is terrifying. <laughs> that's, that is really terrifying. I'm like, that's, that's like a, that's a true nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And no, um, you know, the basement, he would hear voices coming from there. He said he recorded laughter coming out of his basement one time. Um, it was the 1920s prohibition era. So apparently there was a shootout in the basement because at one point they had a speakeasy down there. So from his perspective, he always says that my grandmother did very powerful, beautiful things. Like people would come in and be like, my child's sick. Is they're going to make it? Are they going to make it? And she would give them an answer, give them direction. And he has memories of people bringing her gifts and crying at the doorstep and thanking her. And then he has other memories of her saying something like this guy did her wrong at this, like this, um, like summer campground kind of thing where they had different little houses that you could rent out. My dad says he has a vivid memory of her being like, may that place burn to the ground and that it did burn to the ground. (laughs) Okay. She's powerful as hell. Like literally. Yeah. And a lot of it, I wonder too, she was, she had a quaalude problem as a lot of housewives did in that era. And sometimes I just wonder if when she was like playing with her gifts, if she went into certain places where she wasn't exercising them with a lot of responsibility, I wonder if she was being a little haphazard with what kind of energies or entities she was bringing to the house. I don't know, but my dad always made her this very scary villainous in my mind. And so when my, my ex-husband had that dream, I was like, I knew it. I was like, Oh, she's trying to talk to me. And the worst part is I called my dad to tell him the story. And he goes, how did you know she had long black hair? And I was like, what? And he says that there are no pictures of her with long black hair because she had lost all of it by the time the camera existed. But I always knew that she had long black hair. And you would never you would never even expect that, like, look, like coming from you, like you'd be like, oh, we're all blonde and whatever. And you would never be like, I have a grandma who has jet black hair. No, totally. It came from nowhere. I just always felt connected to her. I felt like we had similar gifts and When I went back to see why she practiced witchcraft, quote unquote, which we're going to deconstruct on this channel too, because I've learned a lot more about that. I was raised to fear it. But when I talked to her cousin, who was more aware of her and had known her when she was alive, she said that in World War I, soldiers came because they wanted her father, my great grandfather, to to make bread for their troops. Apparently he refused and they took him outside and shot him in front of his windmill, which is creepy because we have a photo of that windmill, but it's, um, what's it called? Like a reverse image. It's like the, uh, the negative image Uh Yeah, for extra creepy, (laughs) (laughs) but this, my great grandmother, this badass had nine children. My grandmother, the witch was one of them. And when they shot my great grandfather, they went back into the bread mill where they lived 
and we're about to kill her and her children. And she said in German, I don't know him. I just come here to buy bread. And she had to leave her home with her nine children with absolutely nothing and figure out a new life for her and her children. And she saved their lives that way. And what I was told is that she taught her daughters how to use the crystal ball and how to protect their energy and how to output other energies to protect them because they had no physical retribution in a time of war. And that's why they practice what they did. That's, I mean, that's, wow, that's a lot. I was going to say awesome, but I don't know if that's appropriate to say awesome, but that's, I mean, very powerful. I mean, clearly we've talked about this, you know, in our private conversations that like I, I've known that you've had like witch psychic in your blood. Like I could just tell, um, I think that's, that's not even that far back. That is, that's like just, you know, literally your grandma like lived through that. Um, so of course, like you, you definitely have that in your DNA. I think something that I wanted to mention that really like relates to this is that when it comes to, you said, you know, different times when it's been hard to like be embodied and like, if, if you go through like a depressive state or anything like that, it's hard to like be thankful to be in a body and all these things. One of the things that like I like to think about is like how how much did my ancestors and I mean thousands of years and I mean like grandma, you know, how many how much did they have to survive? Yes, I believe that we're meant to like thrive in our lives, but how much did we also are surviving, you know, until we die like we are surviving and hopefully thriving, but we are surviving until we're not anymore and we we're passed on. So how much do they have to survive in order for you to be in a body? You know, like I think about that with my with my ancestors. There's so much that that they had to s- literally survive, not not just like mentally. I mean, like physically, they had to survive in their bodies so that I could be in my body. And so on the days that I'm not like thankful or not I'm I'm not feeling good in my body, that's something that like really brings me back. I'm like, I and the literal thing that exists because of their survival. Like I am the physical thing that exists because they survived. How can I not be thankful for that? How can I not be thankful that they fought to live so that like I'm here today too? Um, and so with all this that's going on and all the things that you experienced, and of course you went through like religion and all of that. I know when we first started talking, you were scared to like get into it and scared to like, because I mean, clearly a lot of that sounds really scary. Um, I will say, uh, I think there is a, there's a part of me that wants to say that, that kind of thinks that perhaps your grandmother didn't like close things up very well. Like whenever she was like practicing and doing different things like spiritual practices, she didn't like kind of close that door, which we can, we can talk about that some other time. Um, but Every if you are an embodied person, you still have more control over non embodied entities, and I think that's important for people to remember when they are wanting to delve into ancestry or spiritual or witchcraft or anything like that. Like you are the embodied entity, and so you have you have the power to say no, thank you, um, because there can also be ancestors that try to work out their shit through you, and that's not that's not always your responsibility. Um, Sometimes they didn't figure like they didn't heal their trauma and they try to like put that on you. They're like, oh, but but don't do this. Like, don't trust them. I'm like, no, I actually can trust them. Like, that wasn't my lived experience. That was your lived experience. So no, thank you. Like you can you can tell them no, thanks. Because, well, let's get into this, because I think that, um, you know, if people are considering tapping into this and like I said, you were the first person to say hey, what are you doing with your ancestors? So I am just on the beginning of that. And my very intellectual, just honest thing was like, but if they're not perfect, you know, it's one thing to reach out to the perfection of Christ and say, hey, I need help in this situation. If you're reaching out to people who are former embodied human beings and they're still carrying flaws, what is the benefit to tapping into 
their flaws, to risking that they could lead you in the wrong direction, to risking that you are opening doors or channels to things that are going to harm you in any way? And how do you navigate that whole process? Well, I think having a relationship with your ancestors is similar to any relationship that you have. Like, I am married to Adam, who's a really amazing person, but he's also not perfect. I doubt that of both of you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let me tell you, that man ain't perfect. No, I'm kidding. He's pretty, he's pretty damn close. Um, But there are things that like, I won't necessarily go to him about, like, I'll talk to him about, but I'm not necessarily asking for his advice because he's not, he's really not the person who's going to be able to guide me in certain areas. And in some, in some other areas, I do go to him for advice. Um, So I think your ancestors, as you get to know them, which I will say, uh, people say, how do I get to know my ancestors? One is yourself, your body. Okay. So then it's really a lot of like, you know, embodiment practices and like what it feels like to be in your body and connecting with yourself, loving yourself. But two, you learning about them. I mean, I, I, I genuinely believe that like knowledge is power. And I, over the past couple of years have learned so much about my ancestors. I've learned so many of their stories, so many of the, the the things that they've gone through. And I think that's really helped me too, to when I, I have like, um, a recurring, um, intrusive thought, uh, about a loved one getting in a car crash. That's something that like, it's, it's, it can be really, um, like I, I, I freeze, like if that intrusive thought comes in, if you, if you know anything about intrusive thoughts, like you can't like just get rid of them. You can't just like not think it. Um, and I, I've had that forever. I've, I've always had that. Um, and then I only last year, two years ago, I learned that one of my grandmothers, like her parents, both of her parents died in a car crash. Um, and she got split from her siblings and, you know, it was a whole thing. I didn't know about that until two, two years ago. So now with my intrusive thought though, so what instead, yes, it could be, I'm feeling it in my body that like, I'm scared that Adam's never going to like when I call him and he doesn't answer, like I have that, like, oh, he's dead, like on the side of the road. That's just like what I think. But now having that knowledge is power. I'm like, oh, okay, I think I have that DNA. It's it, it's literally in my DNA. If you know anything about epigenetics, it's like, it's a real life trauma that likely lives in my body. And so for me, I'm able to be like, okay, that's, that's her lived experience. And I recognize that that was completely traumatic for her. She was a young girl and, but I'm okay. I'm safe. I'm, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna wait this out I'm not gonna call Adam 17 times which sometimes I do and like I just can't I just don't apologize for it because sometimes you can't you can't help your intrusive thoughts but now knowing that it gives me so much more peace because I know it's not my trauma it's not like my lived experience it's not I haven't had anyone I know personally like a family member that's died in a car crash you know so not in my life so anyway I think that's like an example of having something that clearly wasn't healed in her but I I'm experiencing and I don't necessarily need to heal it for her but know that it's hers and not mine um and yeah I think like I was saying about the relationships thing there's some things that I don't go to my ancestors for um and some things that I go to certain ones about um and I think getting to know them is a really big part of of practicing and and like wanting to connect with them how is the communication like an intuitive thought some like how do you hear them and how do you decipher that you're talking to different people yeah so it's it's fun to like have these conversations now because i'm still in the process of figuring out how to create the language around how it is i i hear from them and i connect because i've done it since i was such a little girl since i was like 7 years old is the first like memory i have of it I think being indigenous, there's something about nature that really connects me to them um, because I feel like my ancestors and like energetics, like they're kind of one and the same for me. And so is nature. Like I think the ultimate ancestor is our, is mother earth. And so when I'm connecting out in nature and I'm sitting down and I'm just essentially meditating and I'm calming like everything in my body, I'm like trying to calm my heart. I'm releasing my stomach. I'm like really just letting myself be a little being in nature. 
I feel like those are the moments when they come through the most for me. Um, because I just try to, I just try to empty my own expectations of what I'm trying to get out of the experience. I'm just trying to be a human. Again, I'm just trying to be a body who is existing in nature. Um, and oftentimes I'll just hear a message. And I think a lot of people call that voice God. And that's, that's okay. Like I, I think having different names for those, the, the intuition, right? So some people say intuition, some people say God, some people say angels, spirit guides, ancestors. They're all different for me. What works for me is ancestors. And I think it's that like that little light that goes off that little like ping that you get, um, of like, Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. I needed to hear that. And like, you're like, Ooh, that's good. Something that you're like, Oh, I could tweet that, (laughs) you know, but like you don't know, or sometimes you do. I feel like those are the moments that like, they're they're coming through to me whenever I know it's not my like it's not really my original thought but it's so much better it's usually from an ancestor and getting to know their stories I can usually tell who it is who's trying to talk to me just based off of their lived experience yeah I mean so fascinating I'm really looking forward to you diving into more of that and like figuring out how to articulate it for people because I think my my experience was first just the invitation that you gave me to consider that maybe just maybe this isn't sinful and bad. And maybe just maybe I can play with it knowing full well that my grandmother at bare minimum has been knocking on my door for over decades, my whole life even, you know, and mm-hmm. I never had the privilege of meeting her in real life. So that's another thing as well. But, um, I think it was really precious. Like after you gave me that invitation, I also was having all of this hardship with my baby being in the hospital. And there was a moment where I was not sure if he was going to live or die. And that was a very tender moment because I was in a state of rage in my Jersey girl because doctors weren't listening to me. I kept having doctors or people in the ER tell me this isn't emergent, bring him back if he stops breathing. And, um, it was just so infuriating and so much rage inside of me. And when I was, I guess, really embodying that rage and really allowing myself to feel it, I was about to output it on someone that didn't quite deserve that rage. That's a whole other story I can tell. But when I went to output all this rage on them, I went into the room where I thought this person was and they weren't there. And I started laughing because I was like, okay, this rage isn't for this dude. It's for all of these doctors that might kill my child. Like, and I was outside at night in Laurel Canyon, which is gorgeous. And there's all these stars in the sky. And I felt the message, like just the way I speak to God, that all these stars and the X-Fans were all of the women in my family who have had to save their baby's lives who have been threatened by men. Like if I think of my grand, my great grandmother saving her children, like so many women in my lineage have had to fight. And I was just like crying and like touching the parts of my body that my baby needed to heal and asking them to like be there to support. And they were like, we're here, we're all standing behind you. And I was like, dang. And then the beautiful thing is it was a couple of weeks later that I was at this Mexican restaurant and I saw one of these gorgeous velvet paintings of one of those powerful, big boobs, like gorgeous, like Latin women. And I got the message like, we're here too, because my baby is half Latin and he has that whole heritage. And I realized I'd only been assuming my white ancestors had my back in the stars and his ancestors who are brown were like, we are also here. Don't forget. And it was gorgeous because I was like, I don't know what that means. I don't know what it looks like for this life or the next. I don't know how tangibly they can work it. Like, do they whisper in the ears of the people at a different hospital to let us in quicker? Like, what can they actually do? I don't know. But I knew I had their support and their love and that they were holding me just like a family member would. Like, just like if they were embodied, they would do if they had the time and energy and ability to be there. I think that's... if there's one thing I can say, like if it, if you're getting a message and it's a wholesome 
sassy message is likely an ancestor. Just from my experience and me talking to other people with their ancestors, usually if it's a wholesome but sa- like sassy message, like a cheeky, sassy, jokey, a little aggressive, like it's usually an ancestor coming through. I also was thinking with your Jersey side, which it is your Jersey side. I also think that could be your grandmother and great grandmother coming through you as well. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And you're right. What you say about blood, like they are living in our bloodstream and limiting spirituality, telling people that you can't tap into this because you have a label of Christian, it's demonic, whatever. It's like, I really just encourage everybody to let your guard down. If something is resonating with you, don't be afraid. The Bible itself says not to be afraid over 90 times. So just play with it. And if it feels wrong and like you're being led in the direct wrong direction and you're scared, follow that intuition too. Then, then it, then it's not right. Like you can trust yourself in your body. Exactly. I think always cope, go back to your body, go, going back to like your body is your safest space. Like you are your safest space. Your body's your safest space. So if anything else, I think that's the place you root back to. So any final thoughts? Well, we started with you wanting to embrace all of the different facets of who you are and to all your work, you know, God is gray and then everything else that you're passionate about and that you do. I am also wanting to do that too. And I think um, Adam and I are in the works of starting back up our podcast, Deconstruct (laughs) and season 10. Um, But it'll it'll come out in the fall. Um, This is actually probably the first time people will see this set up. This is going to be my seat for the podcast. Um, But anyway, we're really excited. I'm really wanting to bring all of all of our beings, all of ourselves there as well. Um, I think we've done enough of creating a really, really like safe space for everybody. And it's time we just make sure it's a safe space for us first and foremost. And we're just going to bring it, you know, bring everything that we are sassy, spiritual, whatever. I love you so much. Thanks for having this conversation with me.